Well, it is so good to be with you again this evening, and I just want to say it seems to me as if though this week has gone by really quickly. It's been a good week for us. We've been so encouraged by being able to be here with you and in your presence and to be able to renew some acquaintances and to make some new ones. And for such a long time, and I've mentioned this before, we've had such a deep appreciation, such a warm spot in our hearts for the church here at East Albertville. When I first began preaching, very early on anyway, uh, we began coming up here and attending gospel meetings and were very encouraged and it's so good to be with you again. And I just want to say a couple of things. I want to thank you again for the invitation that was extended for us to be here, for me to be able to be here and to present these lessons for the good preparation and work that you've put into making things ready for an effort, for an endeavor such as this. And then just for the good attention that you have given during the course of these studies, uh, talked a little bit about this and with some of those who speak. And when you stand before a group of people such as this, you, you know, you see faces and you see expressions. Uh, obviously, you can't read minds, but sometimes just by the expressions on the faces, you seem to have a sense of the focus and uh, the, the intent with which someone is listening and paying attention and, and considering the things that are being said. And I'm so grateful for the way that you have approached that. So thankful for those who have uh, had us into your home or maybe taken us somewhere, extended your hospitality, have provided good meals for us. Uh, we've had such pleasant accommodations while we have been here that have made things very comfortable for us. And we've been very appreciative and, and have really enjoyed that. I've come to appreciate even more the work of the good men who serve here as elders, Brother Henson, Brother Pack, Brother Hall, uh, and uh, Brother Hall, of course, here, I appreciate his work as a gospel preacher as well. We've met on a couple of times, a couple of occasions, good to be with him and Diane again and all their family, but uh, I've come to appreciate them even more, and uh, I think you're fortunate to have them here working with you, and I know Brother Hall does a good job, good work presenting the lessons that he does. I've I've been online, I've listened to some of those, and I appreciate the work that he does. Uh, just a couple of more things maybe I would, uh, would say. Uh, it's been our endeavor to present things that would be edifying, encouraging. Uh, I don't think I've presented a lot of new things to those who are familiar with the scriptures. If I have, we've got a problem, don't we, if I've presented anything new. But it's been my endeavor to uh, bring to our minds a lot of things that we find in the scriptures to build us up, to edify us. And, uh, you know, something else I already knew, but I've been uh, reminded of even more by being among you and talking with you and listening to you, is just how many talented folks there are here overall who work together, who do things that are essential for a local church to be what it ought to be, to grow, um, who do things behind the scenes that just aren't even seen that much, but who ought to be so very appreciated for their work, those who are able to teach classes, and uh, so many things even beyond that. And so I think you're, you're very fortunate. Our uh, sincere prayers are with you here as you work together and seek to do the word of God and follow his word and do his will, is that he would be with you as you do that, and we're confident that, that he will. And so once again, thank you so much for this opportunity that we've had this week and uh, for the good hospitality, the good encouragement, the kind words, the attention that you've paid in our, in our lessons. We're going to look at a familiar study this evening based on what we find in Genesis chapter 22 there in verses 1 through 18. And we're going to be looking at a lesson that I wound up entitling the test of Abraham. The test of Abraham. Obviously, as Abraham went through his life, he endured more than one test, but I doubt that any was more trying than the one that we read about in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham was instructed by God, take Isaac and slay him and offer him for a burnt offering. I think this text here in Genesis chapter 22 is not only one of the most familiar accounts that we have in the scriptures, it deals with one of the most familiar Bible characters that we read about in the Word of God. And it pictures in our mind's eye, I think as we think about the words, as we think about the scene as it unfolds, one of the most poignant, touching scenes that we have in all of the Word of God. 
as we see Abraham, and he's making that trek with Isaac, and they're headed toward the mountains of Moriah, and then they get off of those donkeys, and they begin to walk side by side, basically, up that mountain, and there's a conversation that ensues, and, and we're going to talk about some of those things this evening, and some lessons that we can learn from that. But Genesis chapter 22 is obviously a key text in the Word of God. It's obviously, I think, a key text as we look at the unfolding of the scheme of redemption because of some types and shadows and prophecies that we find here. Things said about Abraham and his seed, that is, Isaac, and of course, eventually there, uh, Jesus in Genesis chapter 22 and there, verse 18. Take your minds back to Genesis chapter 12, there in verses 1 through 7, where God makes three great promises to Abraham. Abraham, I think, is 75 years old at that time. That would make Sarah about 65 years old at that time. And God makes these three great promises. He said, I'm going to make of your descendants a great nation. He says, I'm going to give to your descendants the land that you're in right now. And that's dropping down to verse 7, where we see Abraham there is in the land of Canaan. And I think it's the third verse where he says, And in you, that is through your descendants, through one of your seed, will all the nations of the earth be blessed. And we get to Genesis chapter 15, and Abraham has not had that son. He has not had that heir at that point in time. And there's a revelation given to him by God as to when his descendants are going to inherit the land. And we get to Genesis chapter 21, and of course, and there we see that the son of promise is born. Isaac comes into the world. And then in Genesis chapter 22, God says, Now take Isaac, take him up to one of the mountains of Moriah that I'm going to show you, and offer him for a burnt offering. Kill that child. Offer that child. That's the son of promise. I want us to look at this account for just a few minutes this evening and try to talk about some things that will help us today as we seek to serve God and to do those things that are pleasing to Him, and even some things touching on maybe some of the trials and tests that we have in our own lives. Let's go ahead and turn to the first part of that reading there, beginning in Genesis chapter 22, there in verses 1 and 2. Where we're told here, after these things, God tested Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And there are at least a couple of times in this context where Abraham is going to say, here I am, or here am I. That is, I'm listening. What do you have to say? Here it's in with regard to something that God has to say to him. A little bit later, it's going to be with regard to a question that Isaac is going to ask him. But then again in verse 2, he says, take your son your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I want us to look at that in these terms right here just for a moment. It's interesting to notice that God doesn't simply say, now take your son. He says, take your son, your only son. But he doesn't simply say, take your son, your only son. He says, take your son, your only son Isaac. And it doesn't stop there. He says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. What is taking place here? As one description of Isaac after another is being laid on top of each other, the challenge of the command is being intensified, isn't it? This is Isaac. This is your son. He's your only son. He's the one you love. Now you take him and you offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Let's talk about the nature of the test, first of all. What is being tested here? God is the one doing the testing. And what we see being tested here with regard to Abraham is this. It's a test of his faith. It's a test of his love of God. It's a test of his loyalty to God. His obedience to God. Will he fulfill the commandment that God has given him here? And let's say this just for a moment about the test that God gives. I'm over in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, where James says this about the test that we face in this life. He said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or divers temptations. He says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James here is saying, our overall view of things when we have difficulties, trials come into our life should be one of joy. Why is that? Because we understand that as we endure that test, we work through that test with God's help, 
that it builds our character. It makes us more complete, more mature as children of God. And that's what we're striving for. And then we drop down to verse 12 and he says this, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And so it's not only what is taking place in this life as we go through trials and we have difficulties and we face difficult things in our life. It's not only building character, maturity, making us more complete as children of God, but when we get the long-range picture, and I thought as we were singing the songs just a few minutes ago, how apropos they are to some things we want to talk about this evening, as we think about heaven, as we think about what lies at the end of life's road, when, this, when time is over, when Jesus comes again, we're going to be somewhere forever. And here we see that the one who endures these trials... He says, we'll receive the crown of life. The one who is approved in going through these trials. God does not allow us to be tested in order to try to tempt us to sin. God allows us to be tested because He loves us. He wants us to be strengthened. He wants us to build our endurance. He wants us to become more complete, more mature as His children. And ultimately because He wants us to live with Him forever as we endure those trials, as we endure those tests. But here's the trial, here's the test that is put here in front of Abraham. Go offer your son Isaac, and we see your only son, the son you love. By the way, there's some familiar language there, isn't there, with regard to another son who is offered many years after that. I can't think of any more difficult commandment given to a human being in all of the scriptures than that one. Try to put yourself in Abraham's shoes just for a moment. You know, maybe one of the first thoughts we would have would be something like this. Take me, not my child. Think of a more difficult commandment than that one. Noah was told to build an ark. That'd be a pretty big job for anybody. But that's an easier command than go kill your son, wasn't it? Moses was given the task of leading those often murmuring and complaining and ungrateful and forgetful, sinful Israelites through the wilderness for a total of 40 years. That had to be a difficult thing so many times. It wasn't as difficult as being told to go and to slay your son. Uh, and, and we can think maybe of some more difficult tasks that God gave to Bible characters, but none more difficult than this one. And you know, sometimes maybe someone reaches the point where they look at something that they know the Word of God tells them to do, that they need to do, that they need to change in their life. Maybe some sinful habit or vice that they have. Maybe some sinful relationship that they're in. And they think, that's just too hard. That's just too hard. God wouldn't expect me to do that. And then we read Genesis chapter 22, and what does Abraham say? He says, God commanded me to go slay my son, to offer him for a burnt offering. How do those two compare? Whatever the challenge that we face in our own life, whatever the difficulty that we might be in our own life. You know, I think one of the helpful ways to look at a Bible story, to look, uh, and obviously, uh, when, when I use that word story, I'm talking th th these true accounts, they're all true accounts that we have. When we look at these Bible stories, one way that I think we can be benefited or helped by that is to try to see perhaps ourselves in that Bible story. Which character would I have been? What would I have been doing? What would I have been thinking as this story is unfolding, as, as this parable is unfolding, maybe is related by Jesus, as this, this thing is being recounted? For example, Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. There are a number of characters there, aren't there? Which one would we have been? Would we have been the man that comes to Jesus and says now, hey, who is my neighbor? Who do I have to help? Who am I responsible for, uh, you know, assisting, being a neighbor to? Obviously, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been those thieves. Would we, we wouldn't put ourselves in their shoes. Would we have been the priest and the Levite? Who walked by and passed by on the other side and did nothing? I'm just illustrating here with how I think it's, it's helpful sometimes to honestly, with deep introspection, look at these accounts and say, what would have been my response? Where would I have been in this story here? If we had been the man that fell among thieves, we'd certainly hope that the Good Samaritan came along, wouldn't we? Would we have been that Good Samaritan who stops and helps and does all that he can? 
But let's ask ourselves this question. What would my response have been had God given me this instruction? Had I been in Abraham's shoes on that occasion? Let's talk about Abraham's response just for a moment. But before we do that, we'll talk about this the, the, the setting. Here we have a map that represents Beersheba down here and the land of Jebus or the mountains of Moriah right up here. And that's really where the city of Jerusalem was. We're going to come back to that, but it was a trek of some 55 or so miles. That's the trek that Abraham would make as he's going with the servants and he's going with Isaac to offer him on one of those mountains. And again, here we see another representation of that. But what I want us to go back and focus on is this, is the response of Abraham. Let's think about some things that Abraham did not do that are not recorded that Abraham did. Abraham doesn't argue. He doesn't object. He doesn't question. And sometimes we see even good men, godly men, when God told them something to do, that they didn't have their brightest moment, we might say. For example, Moses. You remember the account in Genesis chapters 3 and 4. God tells Moses, I'm going to send you to the Israelites. You're going to be the deliverer. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. And what does Moses do? He asks a series of questions that amount to excuses that said, don't pick me, Lord. He said, who am I? He said, who are you? And God answers those questions. He says, I don't speak well. He said, they're not going to believe me. And finally, toward the end, he kind of cuts to the chase and says, what? In essence, he says, I just wish you'd send somebody else. Abraham doesn't do any of that, does he? And God says, you're going to go. It's you. You know, Eric can be your, your mouthpiece. Even Jeremiah, there in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 6, God gives him a commission. And what does Jeremiah say? Lord, I can't speak. I'm so young. I'm just a babe. Even Ananias, when he's told to go and talk to Saul of Tarsus, what does he say? He says, Lord, I've heard the many things that he's done. You know, there's a little bit of what? A little bit of hesitancy there, to say the least. We don't see any of that on the part of Abraham. We don't see Abraham saying, now, Lord, can I substitute something for that? I'd find something a lot more palatable than taking Isaac up there and offering him for a burnt offering. Lord, I'm a rich man. What about if I just slay a thousand sheep? A thousand sheep. Would that suffice? Could, could I substitute something? Abraham doesn't listen to God's commandments like in his own mind. I think I'll run that by the religious leaders of the day. I put Melchizedek up there. Uh, Melchizedek is king and priest of Salem. He's obviously a religious leader uh, that Abraham has already had some encounter with. Abraham doesn't run to Melchizedek or anybody else and say, now, now what do you think about this? You know, the, the Lord has told me to do this, but, but does that sound you know, reasonable to you? Abraham doesn't do this. He doesn't try to rationalize his way out of the commandments. And you know what? It doesn't seem to fit from a human standpoint, does it? This is the son of promise. This is the one that he has waited 25 years on. God, first of all, gives the promises when Abraham is 75. He's 100 years old when Isaac is born. I don't know exactly how old Isaac was when the commandment was given to take him up there and offer him for a burnt offering. But from a human standpoint, it doesn't fit, does it? How the promise is going to be fulfilled through him if he is dead, if I have slain him. And he certainly doesn't do something like this. He doesn't just ignore it. He doesn't think, well, surely God doesn't mean that, or, you know, I can just sort of slide by here. He doesn't say something like this. Sometimes I'm afraid people reach a mindset. And if you're like me, you've heard somebody make a statement similar to this. Now, if that's what God expects of me, if that's what God requires of me, if that's the way God is going to be, then I just don't want any part of it. I've heard people say things like, well, that's not the God that I serve. Well, the only way that we know the God that is to be served is to look at His Word and how He has revealed Himself to us through His Word. Abraham doesn't say something like this. You know, I know God just wants me to be happy. And killing Isaac is just not on the list of things that's going to make me happy. I, I just don't think I'll do that. What would I have done? What would have been my response? Had Abraham... Uh, had God given the commandment that he does there to Abraham. What has Isaac done? How am I going to explain this to my friends? How is this going to look among other people? And the list could go on and on, couldn't it? But what does Abraham do? Abraham gets up early in the morning. I don't know how you could have gone to sleep that night. 
But he gets up early in the morning, knowing he's going to head off to take his son to make that journey to kill him, to offer him for a burnt offering. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He's obeying God's commandments. He's doing what God told him to do. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. And we will worship and return to you. Using the New American Standard Bible for our reading here this evening. What was Abraham's response? We see that in this text here. On the third day, he's getting toward the end of this journey, some 55 miles or so. It's a lot of time to contemplate, isn't there? A lot of time to think about what he's been instructed to do. If he were prone to try to rationalize his way out of it, excuse his way out of it, He's got a lot of time to focus on that kind of thing. It's not a spur-of-the-moment action that he's about to undertake here. But he moves with determination to the place that God has designated. And I know you've noticed this before. You've, you've thought about this before. And I have it underlined here. He says, well, stay with the donkey. The lad and I are going to go over there. And we will worship and return unto you. The we belongs to both parts of that. We are going to worship and we are going to return unto you. Abraham is listed as one of the great heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And this is one of the greatest statements of faith that I think we find in the Scriptures. Abraham knows. Abraham puts his faith and trust in God and he's convinced. He's going to do what God has told him to do but both of them are going to come back. You think of some of the great statements that we find in Scripture. I'm turning over to the book of Habakkuk, the third chapter. Book of Habakkuk, chapter 3. Interesting study. I'm sure you've looked through it. Habakkuk's conversation with God. God saying, I'm going to bring the Babylonians in. They're going to punish Judah because of their sins. Habakkuk saying, you know, how can you use those who are more wicked than we are to punish us? And God says, well, the just shall live by faith. Well, we get to this third chapter in verse 17, and we see this great statement of faith on the part of Habakkuk. He says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fall, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Well, that describes a rather down and depressed kind of situation, doesn't it? Although things are not going well, what does he say? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds' feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. What a great statement of resolution and faith. They're on the part of this prophet here, who knows that difficult times are coming. Think of the statement made by Esther in Esther chapter 4. Mordecai, just the word to Esther, the Jews are about to be slain. This evil man Haman has hatched this plot to wipe all of the Jews off of the face of the earth. And Esther's putting her, is risking her life to go to King Xerxes or Ahasuerus to make requests for the life of her people. But when she resolves to do that, what does she say? She says, if I perish, I perish. A great statement of faith, isn't it? A great statement of faith and courage there. And there's so many more that we could talk about in, in the Scriptures. But here is Abraham, this great statement of faith. We're going to come back. We're going to return later. We go a little bit further then in the sixth verse, and we're told this. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took his, in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went both of them together. It's interesting to see how there are two or three expressions or words or phrases that are repeated in these verses here. This one is found twice, in verse 6 here and then in verse 8. So they went both of them together. That puts a word picture in our mind, doesn't it? I think it helps us to see the poignancy of what's taking place here. Here's Abraham. Abraham. 
and Isaac, his only son Isaac, the son of promise, the one that he loves. And they're headed up that mountain side by side for Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. They're going together there. And then in verse 7, here we're told, And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, Here I am, my son. There's Abraham again, and he hears somebody say, Here I am, I'm listening. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And by the way, let me just make this observation. I think sometimes maybe in our mind's eye, Isaac is pictured as just a little boy. You know, maybe six, seven, eight years old, something like that. I, I don't think that's probably the right conception there. Here's Isaac, and he's big enough, and he's strong enough that he's carrying the wood as they're going up this mountain here in order to worship God, in order to actually for him to be sacrificed. And he doesn't realize it there at that point. Think about this question just for a moment. Here's the fire, and here's the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? How would you answer that question? As parents, those who are parents, we've probably had times we've had a question asked by a child, maybe a statement made by a child, at least as they reach a certain age and grow and so on, that maybe takes your heart and either puts it in your throat or in your stomach, you know. Uh, here Abraham is. Where's the lamb? A few years ago, well, it's been many years ago now, about 20 years ago, our youngest daughter was living in Montgomery going to school down there. And I got a call one day, and the call began like this. Dad, I've got something to tell you. You talk about a split second where your heart goes either into your throat or your stomach, depending, I guess, and just so I won't leave you absolutely hanging, I'll tell you what had taken place. Somebody had pulled up beside her at a stop sign and had pulled a gun on her. And it pointed that gun at her. You talk about a range of emotions in a real quick sequence there. And she was asking me, she said, I got his tag number, what should I do about it? But I just use that to illustrate uh, the, 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 the poignancy of a conversation or a statement, a question sometimes, that a child, but, but there's none really to compare with this one, is there? Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? What does Abraham know? It's you, son. It's you. What does Abraham do? He gives the perfect response as they walk together, doesn't he? What does Abraham say in verse 8? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. We mentioned, I think it was Sunday, there's not any filler in the Word of God. There aren't any words in there just to take up space because somebody's given a, you know, a requirement for so many words. We see them again, don't we? as they're walking together, going up that mountain for that sacrifice to be made. Here's the perfect answer to a difficult question. God is going to provide that lamb, and we see again the faith of Abraham. And then in verse 9 we're told this, Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. Abraham had built a lot of altars as we look at his life. Undoubtedly, this was the most difficult one that he ever Built. He arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. There's the third time we see that expression there repeated in this context here. And it tells us something about the character, the open ear of Abraham. And of course, then these words that he hears in verse 12, he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the land, and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I think at least implicitly says something to us about the character of Isaac. We don't see anything here about Isaac struggling, begging for his life. He's bound. He's laid on top of that altar as Abraham is about to plunge that knife into him, take his life, and then burn him as a sacrifice. Now think about this as we think about what Abraham is doing here, about to do here. And in his mind, Isaac is already good as dead, as we read there in Hebrews chapter 11, from whence he received him in a figure, talking about receiving uh, Isaac. Isaac. 
Think about the magnitude of this expression of faith. He's doing what God told me to do, this most difficult commandment, because this is the thing God said to do. Not necessarily the thing He wanted to do. And it's, it might not be anything that, that, that made any real sense to Him at that point in time. It couldn't have been easy. But Abraham, this great man of faith, this friend of God, this father of the faithful, he said, I'm going to do it because God told me to do that thing. And then, of course, here we see in verse 13 that God provided. And Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, and the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heavens, as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Verse 18. This may be the verse we remember, uh, maybe more than any others in this particular uh, account here. God says to Abraham, In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. We'll talk about that again as we close our study this evening. But I want you to think about something with me just for a moment. I'm just going to put this out for your consideration. I'm going to take that screen off just for a moment. Think with me just for a moment at what we might call, I think, the, the typical significance of this account, or how this account here foreshadows another son who is an only son, a beloved son, who is to be offered and was offered as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. You can't read that language in the first part of that chapter. Take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, without reflecting on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, His only Son, the one that He loves. Go to the land of Moriah. What's the land of Moriah? We had our map back up there. You know, to find Jerusalem, you go to the top of the Red Sea, or, or, or the Dead Sea, rather. You go to the top of the Dead Sea, and you go left just a little bit, don't you? You go west just a little bit, and there's Jerusalem. There's where Christ was offered. There's where the temple was built. Offer him. It's the third day when he gets there, and in a figure he receives him again from the dead. Isaac is carrying the wood that he's going to be laying on. He says, where is the lamb? God provides the lamb. And what does God say to Abraham or the angel? You haven't withheld your son, your only son from me. God didn't withhold his son. His only son. He spared not his son, but he gave him. For us. And then you see the seed promise that's renewed here. And we see how that's fulfilled in Christ and the forgiveness that comes in Him. Here's the good news God has provided the Lamb. Under the old law, there were the sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, but those things could not take away sins. There is remembrance made of sins in the offering of those things. But without the shedding of blood, we're told in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness apart from the shedding of blood, but animal sacrifices could not accomplish that. Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. John chapter 1 and verse 29, John sees Jesus coming and what does He say? Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, the book of Revelation is addressed from Jesus Christ who loved us, who gave Himself for us, who washed us from our sins in His own blood. And that washing takes place when one is baptized in water for the remission of sins as a penitent believer. What do we mean by that word penitent? Well, it's, it's like repent, isn't it? To be penitent means that you've looked at things that have been done wrong in your past life. And you say, I'm sorry for those things. I shouldn't have done those things. You have a change of heart about those things. And you say, I'm going to reform my life. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to put those things behind me. I'm going to make reformation. I'm going to make restoration wherever possible. Paul was told in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of 
of the Lord. God provided the perfect sacrifice for our sins. By the grace of God, Jesus tasted of death. He experienced death for every man. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Though he were a son, speaking of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. I think that takes our minds back to the Garden of Gethsemane and the agony that we see there, the prayer of Jesus that we see there. Three times he prayed, actually. But he says, but he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I want to briefly touch on a couple of lessons before we stop this evening. What, what are some of the things that we can take from this? We see Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who died for our sins. But as we see here, the faith of Abraham, as Abraham is tested on this occasion. Well, one of the things that we see is this, and I'm going to turn to James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. And what we see here is that obedience, complying with God's commandments, that is necessary to perfect faith or to complete faith. Faith alone is not sufficient. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 20 and going through verse 24, James writes, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, or worked together with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? That is, his obedience here. And when you get to Romans 4, and we're told there that Abraham was not justified by works, it's talking about a different kind of works there. It's telling us there that Abraham was not justified on the basis of perfection, having lived a perfect life, having never sinned. But what we're told and what we learn here in James chapter 2 is this. Abraham was justified by a faith that put his trust in God when he complied, when he obeyed God's instructions, God, God's commandments. None of us will be able to stand before God in judgment one day. Say, Lord, I never sinned. I never thought a bad thought. I never said a bad word. I never did an evil thing. Absolutely none of us will be able to stand before God and claim salvation on the, of heaven, on the basis of having earned or merited salvation. That's what Paul is talking about basically there in Romans chapter 4. But what we can do is this. We can humbly submit ourselves to the instructions that He gives to be baptized as a penitent believer, confessing faith in Jesus as the Son of God in order to have our sins washed away. That's obedience. That's compliance with God's Word. That's not seeking to earn or merit salvation. Verse 23, And the Scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed, or that is counted to him, for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. What do we see here? We see here that Abraham perfected his faith by his obedience and Abraham trusted in God to provide. Abraham trusted in God to provide. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning there in verse 17 and going through verse 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. God will provide. What did Abraham know? Well, Abraham had already experienced something about the power of God. When he and Sarah were past childbearing age, Abraham's body good as dead, Sarah's womb dead, what did God do? He enabled them to bear a child, to bear Isaac. Abraham already knew what God was, the power of God. Knew that God would provide. God will provide a lamb for a burnt offering. We go through life and we have trials and difficulties, things that discourage and, and disappoint from time to time. Maybe as you go through life, you, know, you get over one hump and you think, well, I've got some smooth sailing here for a little while and then what happens? You know, you run up on two humps then, you know, or, 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 uh, and life is a series of peaks and valleys. But in order for us to be able to endure those things, we need a firm foundation that is built upon biblical truth. There is a God. Jesus is a Son of God. The Bible is the Word of God. 
God is good and just and righteous and holy. And God will provide. God will provide the things that we ultimately need. Paul put it in these words in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Here Paul is in that Roman prison awaiting death. But what does he say beginning there in verse 17? In second, I think I said chapter 1. I mean 2 Timothy chapter 4. If I did 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're faithful to the Lord. We seek to do his will. We seek his forgiveness when we sin. Even if we're not delivered in this life, we'll be delivered in that one, which counts ultimately, infinitely much more than this one. And that is in abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. I want to ask you to turn with me just very quickly to Psalm chapter 73. Psalm chapter 73. I was kind of in between lessons a little bit this evening and I thought about just preaching through Psalm 73. I had to talk to somebody about doing that and I said, I'm kind of in between lessons. But I want us to notice something here in Psalm chapter 73. I want us to notice the first verse and the last verse. And here's a man by the name of Asaph. And he is wrestling with a problem. He's talking about a problem that he has wrestled with in his mind. In fact, he said, my feet almost slipped. In other words, he's telling, I almost lost my faith, he said. When I looked at the world situation as he perceived it and seemed that those who were wicked were prospering and not suffering, and that those who were godly were undergoing all kinds of difficulties, here's how he begins and ends this. The first verse, truly God is good to Israel, even to them as are of a clean heart. The last verse. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. There's a whole lot in between those two verses there, but what does it begin? It really begins with the goodness of God. Abraham trusted in God to provide. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. God will provide an escape when we're tempted so that we might be able to bear that temptation. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. God has provided the armor that we need to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. So many of those implements of that armor center around the Word of God and our faith and the fact that we can go to God in prayer. And then finally, this... Finally this evening, and I've done the wrong thing there. <laughs> well, I hope everybody read the third point there. Finally this evening, what we want to notice as we see Abraham, as he endures this test, he passes this test. He does it because he knows that he's on a journey to eternity. He's seeking a heavenly home. My well, thought as we sang those first two songs this evening, how appropriate they are to things we want to think about this evening. We want to think about those things that are spiritual and eternal in nature. And in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning there in verse 8, we're told this. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, or that is tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Here are people we read about in Hebrews chapter 11 who confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the face of this earth. They recognized they weren't going to be here forever. This life is not even infinitesimal in comparison with the endless duration of eternity that's so far beyond our finite imagination. We need to be looking for that city that's indestructible, that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We're not going to be here long. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And we get one chance at it here in this life to obey the gospel, to obey God, to strive to live lives that are faithful. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, I said we'd come back to that, and the last text we're going to look at this evening is Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, where Peter here in the second gospel sermon says this. He says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying unto Abraham, 
and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from His iniquities or your sins. What is Peter saying here? He's saying Jesus is the fulfillment of that seed promise. And the blessing of that seed promise is this. It's the forgiveness of sins. That's what we need when we stand before God in judgment. We need to be forgiven by the love and grace and mercy of God so that we can live with Him forever when this life is over. Maybe somebody here this evening who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ come to Him simply and humbly as a penitent believer, being willing to confess the fact that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Sins will be washed away. You'll become a child of God. The Lord will add you to His spiritual body, the church. You'll have the hope of eternal life. And the gracious promise that when you sin, when you err, you can go to God and seek His forgiveness, pray for forgiveness, and God will forgive. You're here tonight in subject to Christ's invitation. We can help you in any way. Won't you come as we stand?